Teaching StarCraft Part 1 Episode 7 Zerg Units In this episode, we will be talking about all the Zerg units in Heart of the Swarm. Uh, this is going to be a little bit of a difficult episode to do because there are a lot of Zerg units to talk about and a lot of mechanics to talk about with the units. So instead of doing a normal sort of episode where I sort of do like a lecture style episode with parts and very, very formatted uh, thoughts, I decided with this episode that I would try doing a more informal discussion about all the Zerg units uh, using this custom map called the Heart of the Swarm unit tester online. Uh, this is a map made by a community member, I believe his name is Brandon. Um, and it is very useful if you want to test out various units. For example, I could just select units here and select units here. And I can start a match and I can make them attack each other and we can see what happens. So uh, it's a very useful map. You can find it in the arcade. Just search for something like unit tester or HOTS unit tester. And you can uh, Play around with it yourself. Now, in this particular situation, we're going to use it to discuss Zerg units, but I also want to use this to uh, talk about Terran and Protoss units later on. So, uh, just be aware of that I won't be talking about this map anymore than in this episode. So, when you watch Terran and Protoss units, uh, have that in mind. Now, before we get started about talking about specific Zerg units, I want to talk about the Zerg mechanics in general. Uh, the first thing we're going to talk about is the drone. The drone is the worker unit of the Zerg, and unlike the other worker units, it has to sacrifice itself to turn into a building. So if I want to make a hatchery here, it turns into a hatchery. But you'll notice that I can also cancel the hatchery, and the drone comes back to life. It will also come back to life hurt if it was already at maybe half HP, it cancels and comes back to half HP. And the biggest thing is that if your opponent is shooting a projectile attacking your drone, you can turn into a building to dodge it, and then cancel it, and save the drone and only lose the cost of the cancellation fee. Now, a hatchery obviously costs 75 minerals to cancel, but something like a uh, spore crawler or an evolution chamber uh, would be definitely worth it to save your drone. Now, uh, the drone is one of the few units in the Zerg arsenal that actually moves at the same speed on creep and off creep. Most Zerg units, uh, let's make a Zergling here, uh, or a queen, move faster on creep than off creep, and the percentage increase on creep is very, very large, particularly for queens. It's actually uh, maybe even close to three times faster on creep. But for things like zerglings, they're about maybe 33% faster on creep than off creep, which is obviously a huge deal. So it's pretty important to spread creep, and we've already talked about the various ways to do that. You use the creep tumors, you use your overlords, you use your uh, hatcheries, and you can even use nidus networks to spread that creep. Uh, so that, that's the basic thing about uh, Zerg units. The other basic thing is Burrow. Burrow is an upgrade that most Zerg units have where they can burrow underground, they become invisible and require detection to be noticed, but they can't really move or do anything special while underground. Now there are a couple of units that can do things while underground, such as the Roach, which can move underground if you get the upgrade, or maybe the Infestor, which can also move underground, and it can also shoot out Infested Terrans while burrowed. So uh, a couple of key units like that, also the Swarm Host, obviously, uh, the new unit Heart of the Swarm. So we'll talk about those as we get there, but just keep in mind that pretty much all the Zerg units can burrow underground if you get this upgrade, which, uh, is a hatchery level upgrade as of the most recent patches. The other thing I want to mention is that the Overlord is the Zerg production building. It is sort of like the supply depot or the pylon of the Terran Protoss, except instead of just supplying, uh, su giving supply, it is also a unit. So you can fly it around, it can do stuff. Now it starts out relatively slow. This uh, this Overlord does have the movement speed, as it's just, is just a unit tester, but they start out slow without the movement speed, so they're not the greatest scouts. Uh, but being an air unit and having them very early in the game means you can get a little bit more map vision than the two, two other races with just your supply buildings. Of course, you gotta be a little bit careful because losing these guys would also be a huge detriment, so. Just a little bit of something, and of course, overlords can also turn into overseers. So let's talk a little bit about the overseer. The overseer is also a supply building. It also creates supply for you uh, to build other units. But more importantly, it is a detector, and it is the only detecting unit of the Zerg arsenal. 
uh, aside from a couple of abilities and buildings that also detect. So it's pretty important to have and pretty easy to make because again all you need is an overlord to turn into an overseer and you can morph one right when you have a layer. So get up to that layer tech pretty quick and I can start getting detection units like the overseer. Um, the other things that overseer do are contaminate and spawn changeling. So let's talk a little bit about that. Spawn changeling makes a little dude, uh, looks like a blob, but when it runs into an opponent unit, and in fact, let's go back and let's create an opponent unit so we can see what happens. When it runs into an opponent unit, the changeling will turn into a fake uh, unit of your opponent's color. Notice that it's now blue instead of red, and of the opponent's type. So if your opponent is a Protoss, it'll turn into a Zealot. If your opponent is a Terran, it'll turn into a Terran if it's a Oh, turn into a marine if it, your opponent is a zerg. It will turn into a zergling, uh, and it's very hard to spot. But if you are if your opponent right clicks on it, or it uh, attack moves it, it will kill the changeling. So uh, you gotta be a little bit careful. You can sort of follow units around, try to make yourself uh, less noticeable. And of course, the biggest benefit of the changeling, it doesn't really do any damage. It can't attack but it provides vision and it's hard to spot if your opponent isn't paying attention. So that's the benefit of the changeling. The other ability it has is contaminate. So let us build here a nexus. And uh, what the contaminate does is if you cast on the building, the building can no longer create any units. Um, I don't think it, you know, it does regenerate energy, but uh, there are a couple of clever things that you can do with contaminate most notably stopping important units from popping out but I think I believe it does have a couple of other negative effects as well I uh, can't be positive um, but that's basically it with the overseer so let's go back and talk about the uh, real army units of the zerg now uh, starting with the zerglings so let's make a couple of zerglings here and on the upside let's make a couple of marines that should be good um, maybe a couple more zerglings here. Uh, let's make it even in cost, so 650 to 650, 13 supply each. And zerglings are special in that they come out two at a time. So you have your units spawning on larva since you are zerg, but instead of just one zergling popping out of an egg, two zerglings pop out of an egg. And what this means is you're able to get a lot of zerglings out very, very quickly, especially in the early game. And that's this allows you to have a slightly better scout, which is necessary as zerg, and allows you to swarm over your opponents quicker with the zergling unit. Each zergling is only worth 25 minerals, so uh, for the price of 13 marines, you have uh, 26 zerglings, as you can see here. So the big de deficit of the zergling is that obviously being uh, two for one, they are very weak. They have the lowest hit points of any unit in the game, 35 compared to 45 marines or 40 of workers. Uh, and they're melee range, so you gotta get into uh, into range of your opponent in order to do damage. So if you attack here, with even supplies, we can see the zerglings, they gotta get into the line of fire to do damage to the marines. And they do win pretty handily here. Uh, but, uh, if we reset it, and maybe we put the marines in a choke point. Then uh, the zerglings are maybe a little bit less effective because they can't really get a nice surround on the marines, right? They can get sort of half the surface area that they normally do. So in this particular scenario, the marines are doing just a little bit better here and I think the marines will just barely win out in this scenario. So uh, pretty good here for the opponent player if he has something like this. And of course, a lot of players, when they play, they will create something like a wall off with supply depots. Uh, even if they have a crack in the wall off like this, now your units have to funnel through. And of course, that's very weak because a lot of these Zerglings are dying before they can even get us around on these uh, Marines. So, gotta keep that in mind, making sure to uh, use your Zerglings effectively, getting into that range and getting surrounds your opponent. Now, a good way to do that is if your opponent is attacking into you, you right click behind them and you are sort of set up the surround and then you click attack and you click on the ground after you get that surround off, right? Uh, let's show that again. If you move into your opponent, just attack move, they sort of group up near the front and the ones in the back sort of have the surround. So you surround a little bit slower than if you right click behind and waited for the units to surround first and then attack move like I did just now. 
and you're a lot better in that second scenario. Now, in particular, if you did the first scenario, right, where you just um, attacked, the Terran player can also just kite backwards, right? And you're you're sort of trying to attack that frontal marine with all your zerglings. It's a lot easier for them to kite backwards than if you got that initial surround off. So those are the sort of things that you want to be watching out for micro-wise with your zerglings. Now the other thing about the zerglings, they do have an upgrade. The upgrade makes them a lot faster. So 4.7 width upgrade, 2.95 without. And again, this is off creep. So uh, about 50% faster with their upgrade. And they move a lot quicker. And this is very, very useful upgrade because zerglings are going to be your primary scout. And again, they need to get us around. So notice how quickly I was able to surround this, these marines at this point in time with the upgrades. The marines aren't able really to kite backwards because they're now slower than the zerglings, even with Stimpak. So you do a lot better with this upgrade. One of the most important upgrades in the game. The other upgrade is a Hive upgrade. It makes their weapon attack speed a lot quicker. Uh, by the way, if you don't know how weapon attack speed works, 0.59 means they have attack every 0.59 seconds. So if I get rid of the upgrade, now they attack only 0.7 seconds. So about 0.11 second decrease. I believe that's something like a 20% boost. So it's pretty good. Uh, so that is the Zergling. Now, the things you want to be watching out for with the Zergling are units such as the, and let me clear this out, such as splash units, the, such as the Hellbat. Also, Protoss has units like the Colossus, and Zerg has things like Baneling. So uh, I don't care how many Zerglings you create here, I could create a million Zerglings, and it is not going to work out well uh, for you. As you can see, they die very, very quickly with their low HP. So you get splash damage, they go down extremely quick. quick. And uh, that is the Zerkling. So. Uh, I don't think there's too much more to say about the Zerkling. The big things you want to be watching out for with the Zerkling are choke points. Uh, your opponent's being stuck in very nice locations, maybe because of buildings or just because of terrain, and then units with splash damage like the Colossus, like the Banelings, like the uh, Hellbats. Now the great thing about Zerglings is they're very fast, especially with their speed upgrade, and because they come two at a time and you can build them very early, they only cost minerals, they're very nice scouts, they can sort of go all around the map very quickly and in very large numbers, and they can of course catch your opponent vulnerable if your opponent has a group of marines on the open, maybe he's trying to do drops, you can get a surround off if they're not paying attention. It's all very, very good uh, for the Zerg player. So that's the Zergling, and let's move on to the next unit now, which is the Baneling. Now the Baneling, uh, we were talking about a little bit just there. It is a unit that actually uh, starts out as a Zergling, and you upgrade the Zerkling into a Baneling for 25 minerals and 25 gas. Now what this means is that the Baneling only costs half a supply and it costs 50 minerals and 25 gas. And this makes it one of the most supply efficient and mineral and gas inefficient units in the game. Okay. In particular, the Baneling is a suicidal unit. So uh, if I have a single Marine here and the Baneling attacks into it, the Baneling actually suicides itself into the marine. Let's do that again since that was a little bit sloppy. But once the Baneling attacks into the marine, it explodes and it dies. And you'll notice it only does around 35 damage versus light. So uh, it is almost never worth it against a single unit. Now the reason the Baneling is a good unit is because it has splash damage. So I send a couple of Banelings in here, they will explode and detonate on all of these marines, killing all five of them with maybe two Baneling shots. So they can be cost effective. But the biggest thing about the Baneling is that even though they might not be cost effective, as a Zerg player you might be getting a lot more resources than your opponent, and because they are supply efficient and very quick to build, since you build them out of Zerglings you can get two at a time out of Larva, and you can sort of morph them out of your Zerglings if you sort of realize they have choke points and your Zerglings aren't useful, they're very very effective in that manner. So despite being very mineral uh, and gas inefficient, they are very, very useful for taking down large clumps of armies, and it can be efficient in those scenarios. 
and they are very, very supply efficient. So if you're worried about being supply locked, or maybe you're maxed out 200, making some banelings then can be worth it. Uh, the banelings also have, uh, well, they also have a special attack against structures. They do 80 damage to structures. So it's not too inviolable to use banelings, uh, for example, against a, uh, a wall off. I was talking about how the, um, how the Zergling has a very difficult time, you know, getting through this wall off. I'm trying to attack the Marines. I gotta attack through a supply deal first, and I'm gonna lose all my uh, Zerglings before that. So you can send a couple of Banelings. In fact, since the uh, supply depot is 400 hit points and Banelings do 80 damage to structures, you need exactly five Banelings to get through a supply depot. So you send five of them, you kill off all three supply depots with five Banelings. And again, five Banelings cost quite a bit. It's uh, 50 times five is 250 minerals and 125 gas. So it costs a little bit more than three supply depots. But what it does, it allows you to open this scenario up to your zerglings, allow your zerglings to get into the, the mineral, uh, the marine line, and maybe even the the banelings. Uh, they work out very well with the zerglings, with the zerglings surrounding, forcing the marines to clump up because they are surrounded, and then the banelings detonate on them. Now, uh, zerglings banelings are also useful because if we reset this, you know, there's one scenario where I attack straight up, and the marines are clumped up, and the banelings take care of everything. Right now, if you want to split the marines like so. Uh, then something happens where the Zerglings can get, you know, nice surrounds on individual Marines. They get a nice surface area on these two Marines, and you're a little bit weaker to the Zerglings in this fashion. So, in both scenarios, it's pretty good for the Zerg player. Again, with the with the Terran player, you want to stay balled up against Zerglings. You want to stay sort of at choke points. But if you're sort of in a choke point with the terrain or s supply depots, now you're sort of trapped in a corner against Banelings. So you got to figure out how much you want to have uh, Marines tanking against Zerglings and split up against Banelings and it becomes very very difficult for the Terran player especially because splitting is something that you know takes a lot of practice to do uh, especially because when the automatic automatic AI you right click somewhere will group the units so Banelings is very good against units like the Marines uh, large clumps of units like that and of course uh, the other units they're good against are light armored units since they do do extra damage against light uh, units such as the Zerglite, like I was talking about before. They're also pretty good against Hydralis, uh, and as the Protoss, they're pretty good against Zealots and Sentries. So in this scenario, they would work out pretty well. Now the problem with the Banelings is you gotta be careful. So in this particular scenario, uh, you can attack move, and you'll do pretty good. So you will kill pretty much everything that comes your way against a much larger army, but if I were to create maybe a couple of immortals here, and I put the immortals at the front, the immortals are not the greatest things to detonate your banelings on. Then your banelings sort of just detonate on singular immortals, so they don't get a lot of damage done. This entire army in the back is left pretty much unscathed, uh, and the immortal of course has his hardened shield, so the banelings do even less damage to them. We'll talk about the immortal in the Protoss episode. Uh, so a thing you can do here. Uh, to make sure you're not detonating on these immortals is with your army you sort of right click behind your army uh, again the zerglings might want to attack move against a very large army like this but the banelings they sort of right click and when a baneling dies it will automatically detonate so you don't have to attack into a zealot to detonate the baneling if the baneling is killed in action it will also damage units around it so you can just right click here and the banelings will sort of walk directly into the army and get a nice amount of surface area as you can see, so just move them into clumps of units, and you can see a lot more damage being done there. Not much damage done to the morals, uh, again, because they're very, very sturdy units, but you take out the big mass of units in the back. So that's how you sort of want to be using banelings. Never really attack moving with them, but sort of right clean behind, and then when you get near clumps of units, then that's sort of when you want to attack move. Now, the other thing about banelings, of course, is, if we clear this for a second, is that Banelings are very, very, very good against probes or SCVs or drones. Now, SCVs, they have 40 hit points. Banelings, they only do 35. But if you get a couple of upgrades, so let's uh, do that right now. Um, I can't actually get that. So let's get a hatchery and then an evolution chamber. Uh, if you get a couple of melee upgrades, one is not enough. 
but two is enough, and it shows that the Banley now does 43 damage against light, so it will one-shot probes with double upgrades, and of course it will two-shot probes with single upgrades, and of course probes, mining, and a mineral line, they're all going to be very clumped up already, so you can just run one or two Banelings in, and you can sort of walk in, and you try to detonate, and you get a lot of probe kills for a single Banelings, very worth it to deal damage to the economy line if you can get that. So you'll see a lot of games where your opponent uh, sees banlings and will start freaking out with his probes, knowing that they can do a lot of damage in the middle and trying to split them up and so on and so forth. So if you're trying to deal with banlings, trying to split up your probes, if you're getting banlings done, try to find clumps of units and get that damage done. And of course, plus two attack upgrade, very, very useful. Now, what is the banling weak against? Pretty much the same thing as Zerglings are weak against. Splash damage, uh, long range attacks like the Colossus. Um, now, the Hellbats that I was talking about with the splash damage are not the greatest against banlings because even though they are splash, they're also close range, so they will get killed off by the banlings. They are also light armored. Uh, but the production of the Colossus, very good against banlings, and the Zerg units like the maybe the Roach or the Ultralis even though they don't really have that much splash damage and they're close range, are armored units, and if you split them up a little bit well, they will make the banelings much more cost inefficient. And again, that's the biggest thing about the banelings. Are they efficient or cost inefficient? Um, so those are the first two zero units in their arsenal. And already we have an army composition that we want to talk about, which is the Zerg Lane Baneling co army composition. And we talked about this a little bit against the Marines, where, you know, uh, if you have a bunch of marines, do they want to group up against the zerglings or do they want to split up against some, uh, against the banelings? It's very hard to tell. So obviously, as a zerg player, you're feeling pretty comfortable because you've put your turn opponent in an uncomfortable position. So this is a pretty good composition against any sort of bio units, especially because they're going to be marine based, which are very very weak against banelings, uh, and not the greatest against zerglings either, or against a Protoss opponent that's maybe going very heavy zealot. Uh, not so heavy on the Sentry, and of course not getting Colossus or Templar. That's a little bit rare, so you don't normally see this sort of style against Protoss, but you might see something like massive amounts of Zerglings against a uh, Protoss player who is going very light on Colossus or Templar. And of course, the one thing I want to talk about is that in the Zerg scenario, Zergling Bailing versus Zergling Bailing becomes very, very interesting, because you might have noticed that Bailings will one-shot um, Will one shot, and can I get rid of this upgrade? No, I cannot. Will one shot Zergling. So, in a Zergling Baneling versus Zergling Baneling war, uh, it becomes a very sticky scenario where you gotta get your Banelings to land on Zerglings, or you gotta get your Zerglings to not land on Banelings, you gotta Banelings trying to get on Banelings, and so on and so forth. Two Banelings kill off two Banelings, so a good thing to do here is to have two Banelings go out at a time, and your opponent will send out two Banelings at a time, they'll try to detonate. If you send three or four Banelings together, right, now you're trading in effectively. He's going to have two banelings, they're going to explode on your four banelings, and he's going to have double the cost efficiency of yours. And of course, something you can do is try to get his banelings to Denny on single zerglings. Obviously, a banelings costs 25 minerals and 25 gas more than a zergling, so it costs about three times as much as a zergling. So you want to get at least three zerglings per baneling. So uh, sending one or two zerglings, even two zerglings at a time, against banelings is not a terrible idea. So in this particular scenario, that baneling detonating, killing two zerglings, not really worth it. And so it becomes kind of a song and dance, and maybe I'll just try to show you what's going on. This guy will just attack move, and I will try to uh, set up my zerglings to sort of go like uh, well against the banelings, sending my banelings in first to take out his entire army since it is clumped up and then maybe just suiciding one or two zerglings on the banelings that I can. So it can be a little bit tricky, and uh, you should watch some professional streams if you're having trouble with this, or just practice yourself, again, trying to split up your zerglings against the banelings, trying to split up your bins against the banelings, and trying to get your banelings on large clumps of zerglings against your opponent. Okay, so those are the first two units. Uh, now, before we go into the next unit, we're actually going to skip ahead to the mutilus, because uh, I was talking about using Zerglings and Banelings against a Terran player that goes mainly Marine Marauder, uh, or Marine, maybe Marine Siege Tank, or you could have Hellbats in there, or you could have Widowmines in there. And the general unit that you get with this is the Mutilus. So let's clear it out, and we'll talk about the Mutilus in just a second here. Now, the Mutilus uh, is a pretty weak unit. It is two supply, and actually, let's go back. And let's look at the efficiency here. 
22 supply mutilists versus 15 supply marines and a much heavier cost. Uh, mutilists are 100-100 for two supplies, so they're pretty gas and mineral inefficient and supply efficient in that sense. Because most units are two supply, only cost 100 resources instead of 200. And starting off this battle, we'll see that the mutilists actually do not do the greatest against this clump of marines. Even though they are much, much more uh, costly. In fact, let's go back and let's make this a little bit closer. Let's make it so maybe the marines win. This is 22 supply against 22 supply. And the marines, I'm not using stim packs, so they're a lot weaker than they have to be. Uh, they don't have the combat shields in their upgrade. And it even supply and half the, su uh, and half the army uh, cost, the marines win very, very heavily here. So the mutilists are not a very good head-on unit. The reason you get mutilists with Zergling Bailing is because Zergling Bailings are very, very fast, and mutilists are also very, very fast. Now they have a uh, four movement speed, which is ridiculously fast. Uh, Marines only have a 2.25 in comparison. Even if they have the stim pack upgrade, they have a 3.37. Uh, so they are still quite a bit slower than mutilists, and the mutilists has something called uh, tissue regeneration new and heart of the swarm here which means they regenerate hit points very quickly over time so if you move into these uh, marines take some damage you'll notice how quickly its hit points regenerate over time and what this means is the the mutilists are very very good for harassment they're very very good for map control they control a lot of area very quickly you know these marines they're stronger than the mutilists but i can sort of keep running the mutilists away from them and maybe go into his base if it's over here while the marines are out of position and with the zerglings and the bailings it becomes a very potent composition because the zerglings are of course the fat one of the fastest units in the game as well so you can sort of attack one location with the mutilists attack another location with the, uh, with the zerglings and really force the terran opponent to uh, split into various locations, try to get stuff done here to defend Zerglings, here to defend Mutilus, and of course still be worried about Bailings and that sort of thing. So uh, that's why the Mutilus is very good, and the other reason it's good is because Zerglings uh, and Bailings are pretty, pretty gas, uh, cost very little gas, I want to say. And Mutilus, of course, costing 100 minerals, 100 gas, very heavy on the gas. So you can get a lot of Mutilus, and with your spare minerals, get some Zerglings, and then get as many Bailings as necessary to defend large clumps of units like the Marines. So that's the Mutilus, and I won't talk too much about it, but if you are a Zerg player and you haven't tried out the Mutilus, it is one of the most fun units to use in the game, and one of the easiest ways to get wins against lower level players because they just can't deal with the mobility of the Mutilus. And of course, the big thing you want to be doing with the Mutilus the big way you want to be using the Mutilus is never directly engaging opponent units. You want to be start, starting to pick off units. So let's actually reset this. Let's go back and let's say this guy has a couple siege tanks with his army and we'll, we'll simulate this. Let's say they're in siege mode and the Marines are around there. I just want to sort of clump up my Mutilus. By the way, if you right click sort of below the Mutilus, uh, you can get them to clump up like that. They will normally spread out into a flock, but if you click anywhere within this flock, like this this flock takes up about this much area. Uh, if you look at the Zerg Fire, they actually take up this area on the ground. You click anywhere inside this area, they will sort of they will sort of clump up into the middle. So you can right click like that a lot and they'll sort of fly in that deep clump. And they can come out here and just pick off the sea shanks because they can't attack air. The Marines kind of move out of position. I fly around them. I fly around them, I fly around them, and I go pick off the more vulnerable siege tanks. Uh, try to get some damage done. And this is sort of how you want to be playing the game. Maybe he has some SCVs here. I try to pick those off. Never really directly engaging the Marines. And of course, while the Marines are chasing me around, while I'm flying around in circles, these guys are regenerating hit points pretty quickly here. So uh, that's how you want to be doing it with the Mutilus. Never directly engaging any units that can attack air. But just trying to pick off these expensive units that maybe can't attack air, or going for mineral lines or production facilities and pulling your opponent's units out of position. So that's the Mutilus and a very potent uh, usage with Zerglings. You can even add in uh, Mutilus to a Zergling Roach composition, but once you start adding these units like the Hydras and the Fester uh, or the Ultras or whatever, they cost a lot of gas. So I would uh, steer away, away from going both Hydras and Festers and uh, Mutilus. But Mutilus, very, very strong, 
in all the matchups, and definitely a unit that you can use to win in all the matchups up to even the professional levels. So, just want to point out the Mutalis, kind of a special unit, a flying unit, uh, not really a stable unit, as we saw, very, very weak against uh, even army supplies, but very, very mobile and very, very tricky and very, very strong if used correctly. So that's the Mutalis, and now let's talk about the Roach. And we'll talk about the Roach and the Hydra together. There's not too much to talk about with them alone. So this is a pretty uh, common army composition to have. And the reason these army compositions, the Zergling Bailing and the Roach Hydra, is because they take different attack upgrades. The Hydralis and the Roach take uh, range attack upgrades uh, by this symbol here uh, in the Zerg. And the Zerglings and Banelings, they took the melee attack upgrade. So if you want to be upgrading your units, you want to sort of be using uh, all the units that take that upgrade. So this is the way to do it. You get roaches and hydras as opposed to maybe roaches and zerglings. Although roaches and zerglings is a pretty potent composition. Now, uh, the thing about roach hydra is that the roaches have a very low range and the hydras have a very fast range. The roaches have a lot of hit points and the hydras have a l not very much hit point, very many hit points. But they attack very quickly. They do a lot of damage as opposed to the roach, which does a decent amount of damage, but definitely attacks a lot slower than the Hydra list. Uh, so, the way this sort of composition works is the Roaches get in the front and they start dealing damage and they start tanking damage and the Hydras just do a lot of damage in the back. But, since the Hydras are very low on HP, if your opponents get their units into attacking range of the Hydras, you're going to be in a lot of trouble because this 80 hit points for 100 minerals and a 50 gas unit is very, very low. Um, so let's go back. And let's just show how this composition works against, let's say, a um, a Protoss composition of Stalkers and Zealots, right? So here we have a Protoss composition of Stalkers and Zealots, and if we attack move here with the Roaches in the back, uh, it might not do so well because these Hydras in the front here, they're getting DPS down right away, and now you know he starts starting to attack the Roaches. But he's already gotten a, rid of a lot of your expensive uh, Hydra army and the very high DPS. So he's going to do decently well here. But you're still going to win because I did not create even armies. Uh, you win with 900 resources. But if you put the Roaches in the front, then the Hydras in the back, you're going to be able to save them again for later battle. Again, Hydras are more expensive, so that's pretty important. And uh, the Roaches will tank the damage from these Zealots. So you'll be able to get a lot more DPS down with your Hydralis in the back line. So here, a lot more of the Roaches are dying, but all your Hydras are intact. And now they're DPSing down these uh, Stalkers very, very quickly. So I believe we will do a little bit better in this particular scenario. And as you can see, quite a lot more supply and resources left over in the second battle. So whenever you engage with this army, the micro technique is of course to have the roaches in the front and the hydras in the back. And this will sort of naturally happen because hydras are just slightly slower than roaches. So if you're sort of moving around, uh, the, the roaches are sort of gathered towards the front in the overall sense. So pretty good common composition to have. Uh, especially because you have the low range and the high range exactly where you want them. You want the roaches in the front, and they have low range, so they'll naturally move there. Those are faster, so they'll naturally move there. And you want the hydras in the back, which are weak, and they will naturally move there, stay there, because they have uh, low range. Now, what is the weakness of this army? The weakness is, of course, if the hydras are attacked. So if I go back here, and I add a couple of Templar to the Protoss army, and I start it up like this, and they have size storm, they do. And then I attack, and the size stormers sort of target the. E even if I could target the entire club, I just need to target the hydras. Two size storms will kill off all the hydras, and now the roaches, not as much DPS at the front, so they will get destroyed. Um, so, something to watch out is these units sort of clump out in a ball, and they're very weak against things like AOE attacks. Uh, but, uh, something you can do to combat this is if you're in this sort of scenario. Uh, where you know your opponent has Templar and he's sidestorming, you can send a couple roaches maybe to attack the Templar, uh, try to kill off the Templar uh, before they can get those sidestorms off. And that will save your Hydras, which again will do a pretty good damage. Uh, not the greatest micro there, obviously, I'm trying to c control both armies at once, but as you can see, a pretty close battle here because maybe I was able to pick off those Templar before they got those sidestorms off. 
So that's the Roche Hydro composition, a very, very stable composition. If you want to practice macro as Zerg, I would consider going Roche Hydro every game, making sure you get your upgrades on missile attacks and ground carapace, and being able to outmuscle pretty much any army composition just by having high, high, high numbers of Roach Hydras and the correct uh, positioning and the correct number of roaches compared to Hydra. So that's the sort of army composition. Now with this army composition you can also add in Corruptors because Colossus have that splash damage and they could sort of DPS down your Hydras or roaches very quickly and Corruptors are good against Colossus. You can also add in Infestors to keep your units in place to make sure they don't start uh, get like flanks on your Hydras and that sort of thing. Uh, also Fungal is also good against melee units so they can't get through range of your units like that. And you, it, in the later stages, maybe Broodlords or Ultralis as a better sort of support. Uh, Ultralis, Hydralis are a pretty comp good composition as well. So let's, why don't we talk now about some of the more uh, expensive and uh, clever units. So we talk about all the basic army compositions, Zergling Bailing or Roach Hydra or even Roach Zergling. Uh, the reason you sort of want to go Roach Zergling Baneling is because all these units are on hatchery tech, so you can get them all very quickly. Whereas Hydralis, they only come up at layer tech, so they take a little bit longer to get out. They do a lot of damage, but they uh, come out a little bit later. They can also attack air. So uh, in the early stages, these three units work out pretty well together. Uh, in fact, let's talk a little bit about that before we get into the, these expensive units, these special units later on. So let's talk about Zergling Roach Baneling. Uh, I was talking about earlier how, uh, as a Terran player or a Protoss player, uh, well, let's let's do Protoss since we haven't done too many Protoss units here. If we were to sort of go with this army, and we sort of and we sort of attack move, uh, the Zerglings will come out front, and they so, sort of start attacking the uh, Zealots, and they'll die off right away. But the Zerglings do a lot of damage if they can get us around. So what you sort of want to do here is even though the Zerglings and Banelings are faster than the Roaches, you want to have the Roaches attack first. And the reason is because these guys, they, they're pretty sturdy units, they take a lot of hit, po hit points to kill, and they don't do t too much damage over time, whereas the Zerglings do a lot of DPS over time. So if you sort of attack with the Roaches in front, all these units will start attacking the Roaches, and it'll allow your Zerglings and Banelings to right-click and get into attack position. So let's do that, let's attack. And I'm going to right-click with my Zerglings and get into position with them. Uh, I actually didn't create enough zerglings here, so let's actually reset this. Let's create uh, a couple more zerglings here. Let's make it even in class, okay. And then we'll do this again. Oh, so attack move, and then we'll wait for the zerg wait for the units to attack the, the, the uh, roaches, position my units, and get a very, very nice around like that with my zerglings. And in this fashion, not too many roaches die because they're very sturdy. My banelings and my zerglings got a very, very nice round. So if, especially if you're attacking the wall-offs, so if your opponent had maybe a uh, wall off here, maybe he had some pylons, uh, he had a gateway, you know. Especially in this situation, you know, pushing up against this wall with the zerglings or wasting banelings on pylons is going to let these stalkers get a lot of free shots. Uh, but, the, you know, the roaches, they can stay a little bit further out. So, you know, these zerglings, they die off right away. But these roaches, you know, they can't even be hit by the stalker right now. Maybe one or two of them can hit. Uh, so I can get this wall off down, and uh, I can get this wall off down like that, and then I can sort of, you know, they're choked up a little bit, and uh, while while I choke, kill off the choke off, I get my units in here, and then I start doing damage. Now, if they have a choke, I uh, probably want to have your roaches kill off the choke, but the banelings can kill off the choke too. So uh, that's sort of how the composition works. You can also have, um, if you have a wall off, you can also have the banelings kill off the wall off, right? You had, uh, you know, a couple of pylons here. You had the banelings kill off the pylons. Then you have the roaches come in to tank the damage uh, from the zealots. And then you have the, Z the zerglings run pie and get a nice round on the stalkers, right? Uh, in this particular scenario, I didn't really tank too much of the zealot damage with the roaches. So all my zerglings will end up dying in this scenario. But uh, you can get this sort of picture here on how this army composition works. And of course, very, very fast, very, very aggressive, since all the units come from hatchery tech. Uh, so those are the sort of army composition you'll be working on. All these other units 
or units that you can add on to pretty much any scenario if you want to uh, use them depending on um, their strengths and weaknesses. So let's talk about all of them individually and again since they can be used in pretty much any army composition I won't be talking too much. Now the Ultralist is one of the units that does take a melee attack so it is better with the Zerglings and Bailings and the Swarm Host does use missile attacks so it's slightly better with the Roach and Hydra but they can both be used in either scenario in my opinion. So let's talk a little bit about them. Then Fester Actually, no, let's talk about the Ultralist first, since it's a pretty easy unit to talk about. It requires Hive Tech, so it's very, very hard to get, but 500 hit points, very, very sturdy. And it has a Splash Attack, so if you're fighting against units like Zealots, you're fighting against units like um, Marines, you know, you sort of attack move, they're going to tank a lot of damage at the front lines with their melee attacks, and they will chew up groups and clumps of units, which is pretty good, because the Ultralist... Uh, in addition to being very, very subtle frontal units and having that splash attack, are also late game units. And in late game, you expect both players to have very large armies. So splash damage, like the cleave, becomes a lot more useful. And of course, getting this frontal line to defend things like Hydralis, or uh, your spellcasters, or even uh, having this sort of frontal line with Zerglings, and the Ultralis in first, and funneling in with the Zerglings, forcing your opponent to uh, attack the Ultralis while your Zerglings get surrounds and that sort of thing, can be very, very nice. So that's the Ultralis. Not too much to say about that. The biggest weakness, and you know, let's go back, of the Ultralis is that they can be easily kited. So with, let's, let's just make one Ultralis here. With a couple of Marauders here, Marauders have a very high range, six. Now they don't slow Ultralis, because massive units are immune, uh, but they are pretty quick with their stim pack, and the Ultralis only movement, uh, sorry, movement speed of 2.95. The, uh, sorry, the stim pack Marauder is going to be moving at 3.75, uh, 3.37. So, uh, in this scenario, I can stim up, and I can attack the Ultralist, and with my range, keep kiting it, and just keep running backwards and running away from it, preventing the Ultralist from getting any damage on it. Especially, that's sort of why you can't just only build Ultralist. you got to have something like Infestors, or Zerglings, or Hydras to do damage in the back, so they can't be very, very easily kited like in this scenario. Uh, Zerglings will help you surround, Hydras will help you attack, while the Zerglings sort of stay near the front line, and uh, Infestors will hold units in place with Fungal Growth. So that's the Ultralist, and uh, those are sort of strengths and weaknesses of the Ultralist. Now, let's talk about the Infestors, since I brought it up a couple of times. This is one of the two spellcasting units of the Zerg. Spellcasters have energy, as you can see here, and they have spells that cost energy. Now, the Infestor is special in that it can move while burrowed. The Roach also, I mentioned, could move while burrowed if you got the upgrade for it. And the biggest thing about the, the Infestor is that it can burrow it can uh, cast infested terrans while burrowed for 25 energy and these are sort of free units uh, th although they do have a limited lifespan now the big thing about this is of course in a scenario where you are not mining a lot of minerals maybe you've mined on the map maybe you can't take an extra base because your opponent is keeping you on low ground these units will generate energy for free over time. So every 25 energy, which is around every 40 seconds, you actually get a free infested Terran in the next battle. So you can sort of make up for the fact that you're mining uh, inefficiently by having a lot of Infestors and casting these Infested Terrans. Now Infested Terrans are not the very st the strongest unit, so you have to be a little bit more careful, and 25 energy does take quite a little bit of time to make. So don't be too reliant on it, they also don't take the uh, upgrades of regular Zerg units, even though it looks like they do. It was a recent patch. Uh, but, something that you want to think about with the Infestor, and of course with the Burrow, very very hard to kill, so you can continue to continue to get this energy income, get this Infested energy income over time. The other thing that the Infestor do, does, which is probably its more common use, although the Infested Terrans did see a very, very uh, long period of dominance, is the Fung Growth. Now previously the Fung Growth did hit automatically, but it has since been nerfed a little bit. Nerf means it has been uh, weakened a little bit to be a projectile attack, which means it can be dodged. It takes a little bit of time to get its location, but it has a pretty long range. So if you cast it pretty close, it will almost automatically hit. If you cast it very far, it's a lot easier to dodge. So for example, these units will move here. I will try to fungal them, but they can sort of move out 
if they're fast enough in this particular scenario, not fat, just fast enough. If I move them a little bit quicker, some of them can get out of the way. Now what the Fungal Lord does is it will hold the units in place and it will deal damage over time. So these units, they can't move all Fungal growth. Notice that I'm selecting them, but they can't move. Um, and this guy, you know, you can Fungal growth to keep units away from you by holding them in position. You can Fungal growth for Banelings. Uh, since obviously Banelings, they're melee units and they're hard to catch up to very fast units like Marine Marauder, but if they're fungal in place, they can just sort of just club up in balls and kill them all off. And you can of course uh, just fungal for the DPS. It does quite a bit of damage as well, so as you can see here, large amount of damage. So fungal growth, pretty good with things like Banelings and Ultras, which have that splash damage and require your units to be held in place so they can get into melee range. Uh, also very useful against clumps of units like Marines and Marauders, good against also like Zerglings and Zealots because they are melee, so if you can hold them in place they can't really attack. Uh, but you gotta be careful because they can be dodged and things like Zealots and Zerglings are very very fast if they're charging or if the Zerglings have their upgrade. So uh, gotta be a little bit careful. Now the last spell is a very very special spell of the Zerg. It is the Neuroparasite and what it does is it allows you temporary control of your Terran opponent. So you can sort of use this Terran unit spells, you can make it attack your enemies, you can do whatever you want with it, and then once it wears off, uh, the Marauder goes back to your opponent's control. And of course, it does have a range, so you can't sort of just move it completely far away. That would be kind of ridiculous. But the most interesting thing about this is that you can actually, oops, actually let's, let's build a probe here. Uh, you can actually control an enemy probe or an enemy SUV and mind control it and build your own Protoss base by building a Nexus. Now you can't really do it with a Command Center uh, because the SUV will have to build a Command Center again uh, continuously and you will run out of Neuroparasite duration. But it has been done once or twice in professional play. So uh, a pretty cool spell. If you control a probe, you can take care of Nexus and if you think any of your opponent's units are overpowered, maybe you really don't like Colossus, you think Colossus are way way too strong as a protoss opponent you can sort of just um you know mind control them and uh take take control of uh you know the things that you hate so in this particular scenario not doing a great job but as you can see the classes uh, very nicely firing upon themselves uh, you gotta be careful though because classes do have very long range um so that's it for the Infestor. Using the Fungal Growth on clumped up units, very, very useful against compositions like Marine Marauder. And it, Neuroparasite, a very, very tricky but cool spell if you can figure out uh, neat ways to use it. And the Infestor Terran, just a way of creating more income for the Zerg player in scenarios where energy is more important than minerals. Free units for buffering and for dealing damage uh, are also very useful since you can cast them all burrowed so they can be a little bit more sneaky than normal. So that's the spell casting unit of the Infestor. Once a very, very extremely, extremely powerful and popular unit, but since then has been maybe dialed back a bit, but still sees uh, common play. So let's talk about the last, the other spell casting unit rather, the Viper. The Viper is interesting. Let's talk about the first skill it has, which is Consume. Uh, th the Consume spell, in fact, let's use a couple energy here first. The Consume spell allows the Viper to gain energy by absorbing the hit points of a Zerg building. So the Zerg hatchery is losing hit points and they are turning into energy for the Viper. So it is 200 life over 20 seconds, um, 50 energy for 200 life. So it's pretty good and as you can see, these uh, it allows these Vipers to uh, build up their energy quicker than they normally would, allowing them to cast their spells uh, a lot sooner than they normally would, and in a larger frequency than they normally would. Now the two, there are two spells of the Viper, and let's go back and talk about Roach Hydra again. So we were talking about how Roach Hydra was a little bit weak against Colossus. Um, so if you have Colossus, maybe Stalker here. Uh, it's a little bit weak, and actually, let's go back, make sure the armies are relatively even, not even close to even. Okay, so here is relatively even. Uh, so if you sort of attack move, the Colossus, they do a lot of splash damage, even if they're not focus firing down the Hydras, uh, which pr you, you probably should be doing as a Protoss player, but it's not that big of a deal. You get completely obliterated. But what you can do here uh, is you can use the Vipers 
to cast a spell called Abduct. And what it does is it'll pull a unit across to the Viper and pull these Colossus to your army and uh, pull them out of position, you know, because the Colossi, they have a very long range, but if they're pulled out of position, they can be very easily focused fire down. And then you only have to deal with the non-splash units, which the Roach Hydra is very, very strong against. So you can see here, just a couple of ducks completely, completely changing the course of this battle. So a very, very cool spell. A duck can also be used to uh, pull things up cliffs and down cliffs, and it's very, very useful on other things as well. If your opponent's retreating, you know, they're sort of attacking, they see a Viper, they start retreating, you can pull the lagging units back with the uh, Viper and maybe get a couple of free kills. Also, if you have things like spine crawlers or like a base up here, let's make, uh, let's make a base and make a couple of spine crawlers, you know, uh, they don't want to attack them with spine crawlers because they're defensive buildings. Uh, but you can pull them into the spine crawlers uh, to to make sure they have to engage or lose a free colossus like this, right? So that, th those, that's the sort of usage of the abduct. Now the other thing that the viper has is a blinding cloud. And what the blinding cloud does, anything underneath the blinding cloud automatically has a range of one. So right now, attacking range reduced to melee range. It doesn't matter if it's your unit or your opponent's unit. Any unit has a range of one. So. Uh, in that particular scenario, I was blinding count my own units, not a good choice, but if I blind count my opponent's units, they will automatically try to move into melee range because they can't actually attack unless they are uh, in that range. So you notice that they're sort of clumping forward, they're moving into range of the roaches, which are low range, so that's good for me, and the Colossus, normally with their 9 range, have to move into range as well. So a very good spell, but it can be, of course, microed against if your opponents are careful. So. Uh, those are the two spells of the Viper, and of course, working very, very well with Hydra's Roach composition for that reason. Now, obviously, it works pretty well with Zerglings and Banglings as well, because uh, they are close range units, and your opponent's melee range, they're going to move into your Banglings, which is nice for you. But it's a little bit harder for the Zergling, uh, Zergling Bailing Infestor composition because you got to land all those spells perfectly and you don't have anything to buffer for your vipers. In this particular scenario, the hydras and the roaches have a little bit of range so they can keep the vipers safe against any sort of harassment from stalkers or that sort of thing. But if you're sort of going in with zerglings and banelings, those stalkers can maybe pick off the vipers very easily. So that's normally why you see uh, this sort of thing to protect your vipers. Of course, vipers are very weak against uh, spellcasters like the templar. Uh, which can kill them very quickly, or the ghosts, which can snipe them. And more importantly, uh, air units that only attack air, like the Vikings, uh, can very quickly pick off the uh, Vikings, preventing them from getting their spells off, uh, move forward and try to get spells off. I'm going to lose all my Vipers in this battle, even if I do clean up his army. So uh, you got to be careful about things like that with your spellcasters, also the infestors. Similar deal, except they're ground units and they have bro, so it's a lot easier to save your infestors. So that's the Viper, the other spellcasting unit. Now let's talk about the last uh, new unit in Heart of the Swarm. The Viper and the Swarm Host are two new units for Zerg. It's the Swarm Host. And the Swarm Host is a very, very special unit um, which only attacks from burrows. So most units can attack with bur wall burrows. Swarm Host only attacks wall burrows. And what it does is instead of attacking, it actually spawns these little guys called Locusts. They're pretty strong units. They're all, they're pretty much twice as strong as a Marine. So that gives you an idea of just how strong these guys are. And they go a very, very long distance. And they're essentially free units since you keep replacing them over time. So these Swarmos are very, very, very strong units if you can get these Locusts. Now the Locusts have the problem where, again, they're not very, very fast. Marines are much faster than Locusts, even though Locusts are very good against Marines. Uh, they have pretty low range, three range, and you know they can be maneuvered around. So the locusts, they are completely vulnerable in this state because they have to umbro before they can move. It takes a little bit of time to umbro, and they move very, very slowly, as you can see here. They're also extremely, extremely expensive and have pretty low hit points. So even though they have the very, very strong locusts that produce for free over time, if you leave your locusts vulnerable, uh, you will lose pretty much your entire chance to win game. The thing about the Locusts is, if you never lose your Locusts, you get free units that will continue to do damage over time, and they can go a very, very long distance, so you will eventually win the game. But if you lose all your Locusts, you've lost a lot of supply and a lot of minerals worth of army. Uh, 
possibly for free if they got around your lo uh, around your locus. So your swarm host, uh, very very tricky unit to use, very very hard to deal with if you don't know how to do it. But if you can get on top of the swarm host or you can now maneuver them, they become a lot weaker. So sort of the way you want to be using swarm host is sort of you want a turtle. You want you don't want to be being very aggressive with them because if you lose them, you lose the game. But you sort of want to stay in tight situations. You want to protect your swarm host with other units like roaches or hydras, or spine crawlers or something like that, or queens. Um, and you want to use these locusts very aggressively as opposed to swarm host, since the locusts are free and they do a lot of damage. So that's the swarm host. Don't want to talk about too much about it, but I want to allow you to experiment with it and see what you can come up with uh, with with the swarm host since it is a relatively new unit and a cool unit just to play around with. Now the last two units I will talk about are the Corruptors and the and the uh, and the uh, Broodlord. So the Corruptor and let's just make sure yeah even, even in these numbers uh, the Corruptors should win. The Corruptors are an anti-air unit. They can only attack here. They also have this ability called Corruption, which makes them deal extra damage to uh, any unit do extra damage to units. So if I cast this Corruption on this carrier, all 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 units that deal damage to the carrier now do 20% more damage. Now the other thing about the Corruptor is that it can morph from their Broodlord, but we'll talk about that later. And they do more damage versus massive, like the carrier. So they're very, very good against these aerial uh, ships such as the carrier, such as the Tempest, or such as the Battlecruiser. So you sort of attack here, and I can sort of cast corruption on these on these carriers. I can DPS the carriers down very quickly. I can attack on the Void Rays pretty quickly. In this particular scenario, I think I might lose this fight, but it's a pretty close fight considering how how inefficiently um, sorry how small my corruptor army is compared to the carrier. Uh, void ray composition, as you can see here, uh, much smaller here. If I went to even supplies, it'd be a pretty uh, big fight for me. Now, in particular, though, uh, void rays are not the greatest thing for corruptors to fight against, since they do have plus two armored as well, uh, and the and the corruptors are armored. But definitely not a bad choice uh, to kill void rays with corruptors, as you can see. In the even numbers against void ray carrier, they do very well. So. Uh, Corruptors, one of these units uh, that can also attack Colossus, by the way, since Colossus are air units. Uh, Colossus, sorry. Colossus are ground units and air units, so they can attack B by attack by both. And they are massive, so very good to Corruptors against them. Uh, Corruptors, one of these units that are very, very good against specific units only. Things like the Carrier, things like the Colossus, things like maybe Phoenix, which are air units, or things like uh, Tempest. Or as a Terran player, battle cruisers, um, decent against Vikings, but not the greatest since Vikings are also anti-air units. Uh, but those are the sort of only times you're going to be building corruptors when you see these specific units out, like the uh, Colossus or the battle cruiser that make you feel like you need some sort of anti-air. This is the unit to go to. Now the other thing about the corruptor is once you get a hive tech, you morph a greater spire. They can turn into this thing called the Broodlord. And the Broodlord, sort of like the Swarm Host, except instead of being a burl on a ground unit, it is a flying unit. And instead of creating uh, locusts, it creates Broodlings. Now, Broodlings are not as strong as locusts, and they also take melee attacks instead of range attacks. So maybe you're going Zergling upgrades, you can go into Broodlords. Uh, but they have a pretty long range, and the Broodlords are a lot beefier. They have 225 hit points as opposed to 160 than the uh, sorry than the uh, locust and on top of that their attack actually does damage in addition to creating uh, broodlings so if your opponent has splash damage that kills your locust or whatever they still will take damage from the broodlords over time so as you can see here broodlords is pretty quickly dpsing down units and the it also distracts the colossus with the broodling so that Maybe it's a little bit harder to get underneath the Broodlord. So one of these units that uh, was very, very powerful in Wings of Liberty before Heart of the Swarm, still very powerful these days, but the biggest weakness is that they're very, very slow. And again, if you can get underneath them, in fact, let's go back. Oops. 
Let's go back and make a couple of brewers. Let's make a couple of stalkers. Um, more stalkers than brood lords. And we'll we'll notice here that you know if they can sort of attack your brood lords, you can sort of tie them away and they'll start attacking your broodlings. But if they can get underneath their brood lords, they can sort of kill them off. Uh, but you know, again, similar with the swarm host, uh, you can sort of defend them with spine crawlers. You can defend them with fung growths, that sort of thing. The biggest thing about the Broodlords, again, is immobility like the Swarm Host. They work pretty similarly, and the fact that they are massive air units. So things like Corruptors or things like Vikings are very, very good against them. So uh, that's the Broodlord, and those are all the Zerg units I wanted to talk about. Uh, if you are watching this episode, I encourage you to try out all the Zerg units uh, in your games as a Zerg player. I want you to try out Zergling Baneling attacks. I want you to try out Zergling Baneling into Mutalist strategies. I want to mix in some uh, Broodlords later on. I also want you to do Roach Hydra a lot and try to get a feel for those compositions. And uh, just figure out which units you like, figure out which units you want to play with, and uh, you know, come up with clever ways to use them because I can't tell you what to do. Uh, I can't tell you everything to do in this tutorial. So I'm telling you the basics, I'm telling you the strengths and weaknesses, and I leave you to figure out the rest. So until the next episode, that's what you should be doing. Hopefully you enjoyed this episode and enjoyed the more informal style of it. Uh, again, I just could not get a very, very formal discussion that was not completely lengthy and boring and uh, convoluted. So uh, this is the best I could do. Thanks for tuning in, and we will see you next time with more... Uh, discussions about Protoss and Terran. If you like teaching StarCraft, please support me by donating to my PayPal or subscribing to my YouTube channel. You can also follow me on Twitch and Twitter at twitch.tv slash adonsc and twitter.com slash adonsc. For more information and timestamps, please check the description below.